this is Rachel, and this is topic 25 in our supervision curriculum, managing a team. So we've talked so far about all of the ways that you can change behavior with your individuals. And now we're going to start talking a little bit more about how do you actually do this in practice? Um, what are some of the components in application that are important to make sure that you are successful? So managing a team. The treatment team should be all of the people that are in contact with the individual, that are supporting the individual, that care for the individual's well-being. It should center around the individual, their needs, and what their interests and preferences are. And the team should be working to help support the individual in meeting their goals, in improving their quality of life, and helping them achieve the things that they want for their life. Consistency in teaching and responding to overly adapted behaviors across people are going to make learning more efficient. So having more people in the individual's life um, on the same team, on the same page about what to do and how do we best support this individual are going to help the learner to be more effective and efficient in their uh, learning, uh, to learn more quickly, and to then be able to achieve their goals and get their needs met. So typically, the team is going to consist of the individual, um, in this case, since we're talking about behavior analysis, a behavioral consultant, um, maybe a team leader, the direct care providers, parents, caregivers, and any other provider that is involved in the individual's care. So that might include school personnel, um, related service providers, speech, OT, PT. It also can include, include other groups, um, maybe uh, religious groups that uh, the individual receives support from or at activities or clubs or things like that. Any individual that is invested in this person's success and well-being can be a member of the team. So first of all, like I said, it should center around the individual. They should be included as much as possible in their own treatment. Now, for individuals who have a lot of communication skills and are able to sit at the table and be in those meetings, they absolutely should. They should be consenting or assenting to every single thing that is in your treatment plan. If they cannot consent, um, they still should be involved and included and things should be met around what their needs are and what their interests and preferences are. Um, if they're not able to completely participate in the meeting, you can still involve them through asking them what they do like, asking certain preferences, conducting preference assessments if they can't uh, communicate it vocally or verbally to you. Uh, making sure that they are enjoying uh, the treatment time when they are working with someone, um, making sure that the goals are helping them to meet their needs, and making sure that uh, their quality of life is improving. And there are some, you know, official measures that you can use to try and measure uh, quality of life. Um, and then you're going to include the behavioral consultant. Generally, this is someone that's going to hold a graduate degree and a certification or a license. Uh, and this is the person that's supervising the behavior analytic programs. 
Um, they are also going to be conducting assessments and making treatment recommendations based upon the data and the feedback from the rest of the team. Generally speaking, the behavioral consultant is probably not the person who's working with the individual on a daily basis. And so they are reliant upon the team to take the data to report back to them how things are going so that they can adjust things based upon what everybody is observing. There might be a team leader. This could be um, if your organization has a BCABA. This might be something that the BCABA could do, and the BCBA would be the behavioral consultant. Or depending upon the structure of the organization, the behavioral consultant might be the BCABA and the team leader might be somebody who is accruing hours towards certification. And so they are assisting or doing a little bit more than the providers. Alternately, it could just be a provider who has more experience or education or has been with this learner for a while. And so they have a little bit more information. But the team leader position um, would oversee or supervise the program implementation, would make sure that everybody um, is uh, implementing things the same across providers. They might also move items, uh, activities, and goals to the next step as things are mastered. So they're not making new ones, but they are saying, yes, this one's mastered. Let's move to the next step that's outlined. Um, they may recommend new programs and potentially they might have the authority to make decisions about changing something in the moment if the behavioral consultant is unavailable. Now that is assuming that there is consent for making any of those changes. The behavioral providers, this is gonna be your behavior technician, your direct service provider, maybe your registered behavior technician. They're gonna be the ones that are working directly with the individual on a regular basis. Um, they would report relevant information directly to the team leader or up to the behavioral consultant if the team leader is unavailable. Um, their job is to implement the programs as they are written, so not to make changes or assess anything new, but just to implement what has been already approved and they've been trained on. They want to maintain an atmosphere of trust and respect with the parents and the caregivers, the family, also with the individual so that we can support the individual. And they need to record all the data and attend all of the team meetings. The parent or caregiver is also involved and their role is around providing an environment that's suitable for meeting the learning needs of their individual, um, advocating for their learner, uh, so they should be speaking up if there are concerns or, or uh, challenges or questions. Uh, the parent and caregiver, their job is to advocate on behalf of their learner if their learner cannot advocate for themselves. Um, they should be completely, totally involved participating in goal setting, um, helping to uh, advocate for the individual, helping to uh, the behavioral consultant to understand the family dynamics and the environment in which the learner might need some skills. Um, they, parents and caregivers can help generalize the skills from uh, an instruction setting into the natural environment by also practicing those skills or helping to identify how things need to be worked on to generalize. And the parents and caregivers should notify the behavioral consultant if they have any concerns whatsoever. And behavioral consultants should be responsive to parents and caregivers who are advocating for their learner, who are asking questions to better understand, and who are expressing any concerns. The parents and the caregivers um, outside of the individual are the experts on that individual. The individual themselves is their own expert, um, but if they are not able to communicate all of those things, uh, then the parents and caregivers would be the next people that would know the most and should be the best advocates for the individual if they cannot self-advocate. Other providers, so these might include um, 
school personnel, uh, after school or or social group um, or or leisure group leaders. Um, it might include other service providers. It can include medical personnel, um, anybody else who is supporting this individual in some capacity or is invested in this individual's well-being can be part of the team. Their goals would also be, or their roles would also be to participate in the goal setting. It's super important to have a interdisciplinary team so that you can hear the different perspectives and incorporate all of this wonderful inter, inter incorporate all of this wonderful information into an interdisciplinary wraparound support for the individual. Um, we as behavior analysts uh, might have a lot of training in how to reinforce behavior, how to change behavior, but we don't necessarily get instruction on what behaviors we should be selecting. What is the developmental sequence? What is age appropriate or what is developmentally appropriate for an individual? And that's where a lot of collaboration can be very helpful to determine which sounds we should be working on when we're working on vocal imitation and which uh, motor skills we should be targeting um, when we're working on something like a uh, handwriting grip. We can't just jump to sort of the end product that's not developmentally appropriate. So including other providers can be very helpful in identifying what should be worked on and then how we can support that individual in a way that best meets their needs. The providers can also help, or these other individuals can also help to generalize skills from instruction to the natural environment. And they should also be notifying the behavioral consultant of any concerns. The behavioral consultant's job is to help change behavior, not to dictate how things should be done and one way only. We should be listening to others, we should be receptive to the concerns expressed by other individuals, and we should address those concerns not by defending what we're doing, but by helping to meet the needs of an individual in a way that is not raising concerns with other people that care about this individual. Now, we have a team, what do we do with this team? Um, the most important thing I think about the team is that the team should meet regularly to help continue to support the individual, to monitor their progress, and to main, maintain consistency across environments. Um, regularly, periodically, that specific time window is going to depend upon a lot of factors around um, maybe how frequently the individual is receiving supports, um, scheduling obviously is a concern, how quickly an individual might be mastering um, skills or moving on to new skills. So there are changes happening with the programming. Um, if there are uh, concerns that people have, um, how often those concerns are coming up, are overly adapted behavior, how often are overly adapted behaviors occurring, those might dictate the frequency. In my practice, um, we met a minimum of monthly uh, because even for individuals who only received services maybe two times a week, um, that still provided a sufficient number of data points to be able to look at data and see how uh, the individual is progressing or see what changes need to be made. Um, you want to make sure that you're meeting frequently enough that you can identify when changes need to occur and that you are not slowing down the learner by not adapting to how they are doing. Um, now, 
everyone on this whole expansive team may not be able to meet at every meeting, right? So there might be other ways that you can communicate that information or uh, get their information from them. Maybe it's an email that goes out and there's an email check-in that occurs monthly, but then the, the core team, so the behavior analytic team, the caregivers and the individual are meeting together face-to-face, -to -face, um, could be on Zoom, right? Or on a uh, virtual, um, but they're meeting uh, live and um, talking to everybody about how things are going. Um, and maybe the other providers are not able to attend, but they're able to submit information and ask questions and get the notes from the team meeting from there. But you should try to be meeting frequently um, with everyone so that you can continually change what it is that you are doing to best support the individual. Now, during the team meeting, um, you should in, uh, review the data that exists. You should make changes to programs or treatment plans um, as needed based upon that data. Um, you should also be able to assess the fidelity of the program implement implementation and the reliability of the data that's being collected. So trying to determine within that team meeting how this program has been going. Has everybody been implementing it in the same way? Is everybody collecting data in the same way? Um, that will give us more information about what we need to change. Fidelity of implementation and reliability of the data could be assessed by having um, individuals uh, demonstrate certain programs or run certain programs with the individual in that moment. So, you know, maybe we can practice this skill with the learner here and let's see how it's going. Let's make sure that everybody is um, implementing it in the same way. Now that might work really well for younger learners um, where it's a play skill and you are running that play skill, they get to interact with you because all of their people are here in the room at the same time. Um, or perhaps that is done outside of the team meeting, but it's done in separate sessions like individual supervision or oversight um, when people are implementing um, because either the individual is not uh, or those activities are not available to practice at this time um, or the individual declines to practice those activities at this time, right? But there are ways to try to assess that. Um, you should also take time in the team meeting to make sure that you hear from everybody. Specifically, I like to open team meetings by asking the individual how things are going and what they want to get accomplished with today's meeting and asking the parents or caregivers how things are going and what they want to get accomplished. And then we start going through providers and hearing from everybody and looking at the data and um, making changes and doing training if necessary. Okay, here, let's change it to this. Let me show you, here's what it's gonna look like. Let's role play or let's um, practice it with the learner right now if they want to, those types of things. Um, you may want to hold team meetings to address any new issues that are arising. Um, this is also the time for people to bring concerns, uh, perhaps, and, um, and then you want to develop ways that you can address those concerns. All right, so the assignment would be identify all the participants of the team. You can go off of our example, or you can use the specific um, terminology for your setting. If you're in an agency, what are all of those roles? If you're in the school, who is in all of those roles? Uh, describe the roles of each of those team members that you have identified. Discuss the goals of the team meeting and then write an outline or an agenda for conducting a team meeting. What's the order? How are you going to do things? Make sure you have everything covered in the team meeting. So that's today's topic. As always, if you want to, you can ask questions or um, comment with your answers, and I'm happy to answer questions and provide feedback. If you'd like to see more of these, please subscribe, and hopefully we will see you next time. Thank you.